This week, it's part two of our dive into the Jack the Ripper case. And we're talking about the suspects. So many suspects. Listener discretion is always advised. All aboard the Midnight Train. Hello, passengers, and welcome to the Midnight Train, where we bring the dark to light. We make fun of a joke about creepy stuff by bringing you as much information on each topic as possible. Yes, we are a comedy podcast. You probably knew that. And things can get kind of dark, you know, talking about death and things of that nature. Listen, if you're not into that, we get it. Mm -hmm. But if you are, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I am your host, the conductor of the cryptic, Jonathan Sayer. And with me today, of course, in the co-host chair, it would be the one and only Mr. Moody. I am so glad to be here today. Are you? Yes. Are you uh, titillated? Could say that. I mean, I mean, I could say it, but are you? Yes. Okay, cool. (laughs) So our Patreon bonus for this week, we're actually going to be discussing the (laughs) Netflix series, uh, Jimmy Savile, a British horror story. The fucking loony. If you haven't watched it, there will be spoilers in that for all of our Patreon. And if you aren't a Patreon producer or a pooper, get on over there immediately. And if you uh, don't like spoilers, well, you know, wrong show. (laughs) We tend to do that a lot. So yeah, get over there, support the show and listen for a while. And we make a spoiler on it. Then that's, Fuck you. And, and you're, you know, it's the pay thing, you know, so you're paying yeah. to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So therefore only the special people. How long is it? Has it been out for a while? This thing? I think it just came out recently. I just oh, watched it last yeah. night. Then you're the asshole. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. We all know that. You know what I mean? It's like, true. Yeah. Like it's, that's not a surprise to right. everybody. If you're new here, we're both assholes. Yeah. Well, right. well, that's just well. who we are. That's who we are. <laughs> so listen, we'll save the rest of the business stuff until the end. Let's just get into it. Turn down the lights, adjust our seats, Ooh. grab a drink, and let's get creepy. Oh. But first, here's a toast to all you beautiful motherfuckers. Oh. You like that? Oh. <laughs> that really sets the mood. Oh. You got that? Coffee, 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 coffee. Wow. That's good. Lots of coffee. Yeah. It, um, yeah, this is coffee. I had espresso earlier. Oh, oh, oh boy. So, for those of you that don't know, while we're, while we're listening to this, John has been in pajamas for two days. They can't hear you. This is really loud. This is probably a good thing. <laughs> so they just hear it in the back. Like, yeah. So what he was hey. actually saying is, yes, I've been in my pajamas for two days. Uh, two days right? Now. Yes. Right? Two He's in his pajamas days. as we are recording. This. I actually had a day off. In the afternoon, by the way. It, it is in the afternoon right now. Yeah. <laughs> Came home from work on Saturday. Yeah. Went directly to the shower. Oh, very nice. Put on my pajamas and have not left them. So you're going to go back into the shower. And now it's you... Monday. <laughs> <laughs> At around 1.30 in the afternoon. Ah, oh, dude, that's great, though. Yeah, you know what, man? I, I just, I hadn't had a day off in forever, so I said... If anybody deserves it, it's you, buddy. Oh, thanks. You thanks, man. You deserve it, Yeah. Man. Seriously, my wife looked at me today. She's like, seriously. She's like, actually, she called me a bum. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, you're a bum. And I just went, hey, Meh. <laughs> sometimes you got to be. Meh. All right. So this week, listen, it's part two. Hopefully you guys listened to part one of our Jack the Ripper uh, episodes here. And uh, last week we talked about the uh, the victims. Yes. The crimes. Correct. The, the possible crimes. Yeah. The the hor- horribleness of the them. The horrific acts. Yes. They were pretty bad. Yeah, they were. Yeah. So if you haven't listened to that one, go back and listen to it because it'll it'll probably make more sense, even though I mean, we don't really make sense as. Probably know what's going on anyway. Right. Yeah. Well, that's true. It's, if you don't know about any, if you've never heard of Jack the Ripper. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm, it sounds like you're living your best life, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, or, you know, you're missing out. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, on to the suspects here. <laughs> you're, the, you're in the wrong place. That way. <laughs> there is a ton 
of information out there. Oh my God, there's so many suspects. There's a few. Yeah, uh, so pretty much everyone who was alive at the time was <laughs> basically a suspect. And maybe some of them weren't. Yeah. You know, so yeah. who knows? Anyway, hopefully you guys are ready for this. Uh, here we go. Shall we? Uh, yeah, we shall. Are we going to do this? Uh, We're really doing this? Yes. We're doing this? Yes. Um, All right, man. Wait a minute. Oh. That's just the first one of many. Just, just to get that going. In there. Uh, all right. Yeah. As I'm going through yeah, yeah. this, all I kept in my, hearing in my head is dan, dan, dan. Yeah, there's, there's some, so many. So first up, shit. we've got Montague John Druitt. All right. The first of our suspects on the list. With a name like that, he's got to be a killer. Yeah. Well, maybe. All, his middle name is John. Yeah. Although his they're... first name's fucking Montague. <laughs> Montague. Hello. Yeah. I stab people. He's definitely got an underbite. Yeah. <laughs> James W. B- Longbottom. <laughs> Although there may not be any concrete scientific evidence against him, the uh, Jack the Ripper murders in London's East End ended after Druid's suicide, and it convinced one London detective, a Sir Melville Leslie McNaughton. Oh, my God. Yep. the fuck is going on over there? I mean, it's, it's England. What was it? Say it again. Melville Leslie McNaughton. His... N- Okay. Yes. Uh, Melville a, McNaughton. Yes. I had an uncle uh, named You think Leslie. that dude played cricket? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Doesn't everyone play cricket over there? I and, don't know. I thought that... And either, that's like I would huge. say either cricket or quote-unquote football. I think it's just as big... Cricket's it, big over there, yeah. I think it's as, like their baseball like to cricket us. cricket and like India. They're huge. Yeah, like it's we, dude, cricket players over in India, maybe over in the UK, I'm not sure, but in India for sure, they're like rock stars. Yeah. Man, they're balling. They're making a shit ton of money. It's crazy. I want to what am I cricket. doing with my life? Not playing cricket. I probably would have been a terrible cricket player. The only crickets you hear is when we're on this show. <laughs> Sorry. Right. First of all, first of all, <laughs> I'm the one that makes bad jokes. Here. Sorry. You're right. I apologize. That was so, good. That was good, though. So Mr. Uh, McNaughton over here, Detective McNaughton, he Melville. did believe that uh, Druitt was, in fact, the Ripper. Okay. Okay. What, uh, what led him to believe this? Just because. Well, I will tell you. Okay. Yeah. So Montague John Druitt, son of prominent local surgeon William Druitt. Oh, ah, son of surgeon. a surgeon. Yeah. He's well, the son of a surgeon, man. <laughs> like a surgeon. Ooh. So he was a Dorset born barrister. Oh. He also worked as what an the assistant. Fuck is a barrister. Um, that's the guys that make banisters. I thought it was the coffee guy. That's a barista. Yeah, barrister. No, you look it up. But he also worked as an assistant schoolmaster in Bla- uh, Blackheath, London, to uh, supplement his income. Outside of work, his primary interest was cricket. <laughs> there it is. I t- All right. Well, this is the, the, the suspect, not the detective. <laughs> I'm telling you, everybody plays. Barrister. Underneath it, it just says lawyer type. <laughs> oh, okay. So he's one of the guys that wears like it's the a wigs. type of lawyer in common law jurisdictions. Barristers mostly specialize in courtroom advocacy and litigation. Their tasks include taking cases into in superior court and tribunals, drafting legal pleadings, researching the philosophy, hypothesis, and history of law, and giving expert legal opinions. So they're lawyers. Yeah. Okay. Or it's Barrister's Deli in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh. Uh, it's only got 1.6 stars, though, so. I really hope it was that one. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So he played alongside the likes of Francis Lacey, the first man knighted for oh, services to cricket. Francis Lacey. To, for, for cricket. He got knighted for being a cricket. Imagine how good you have to be at a sport to get knighted. Yeah. Well, that 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 Jimmy Savile guy we're going to do the thing on, he got knighted. Yeah. 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 Well, he's a. Before a, they kind of thought there was some. Uh, we'll talk about it. It's yeah. dude. It's insane. What a crazy yeah. story due to such a turd. So he was the first knight, um, you know, or first person knighted for services in cricket. His numerous accolades in the game include dismissing John Shooter for a duck. Oh, man. The English English batsman was playing for Bexley Cricket Club at the time. Dude, those guys were the shit. I don't know what any of that means, and I'm not going to pretend that I do. Bexley Cricket Club, dude. You don't know Bexley Cricket Club? What the hell's a duck? I mean, I know what a duck is, but in cricket, what is it? You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's where they hit the thing, that ball, and then they throw it. And the guy whacks at it, and then they run. That's a duck. That's a Basically, duck. So it's, <laughs> it's when they hit it really hard, and the guy yells, duck. Because <laughs> it's, it's coming at you. <laughs> he made that guy duck. Oh, a what, lot of times, right? Yeah. So on the recommendation of Charles Seymour and noted fielder Vernon Royal, Druitt was elected to the oh man, Marylebone Cricket Club, the, or the MCC, oh, yeah. on May 26, 1884. 
One of the minor matches for MCC was the with England bowler William Atwell against Harrow Ooh. School on June 10th, 1886. And the MCC won by 57 runs. So this is the funny thing. We're with this to us. We're like, we have no idea what we're saying, right? Not now. even a clue. But like there's people over in, in, in Great Britain that are listening to this. Just like, oh, I fucking remember that shit. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I remember hearing about that. My dad used to tell me all the stories about fucking Bexley Cricket Club. Yeah. And we have holidays based around that. We fucking made that guy duck. Yeah. <laughs> 57 <laughs> times. <laughs> Montague John Druitt's decomposed body <laughs> oh my. was found floating in the ta- the the Thames 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 River. Let's see, I know it now. Thames, the, the Thomas Thomas, <laughs> the Thames near uh, Cheswick on December thirty first, eighteen eighty eight. Oh. He had a return train ticket to Hammersmith dated December first. A silver watch, a check for fifty pounds and sixteen pounds in gold, equivalent to right around uh, fifty six hundred pounds. Yeah, for for the check and around eighteen hundred pounds of gold. How many farthings? Is this? <laughs> I don't know. You you can you can do that math. I'm, I'm done with that. All right. He is believed to have committed suicide. A line of thought substantiated by the fact there were stones in his pockets, possibly to keep his body submerged in the river. Oh yeah, because no one would do that if they were trying to fucking murder him. Right. You're gonna. There's a lot of oh, this. He must have tied the cinder blocks to his <laughs> own feet and threw himself overboard. He must have put his feet in cement himself. Yeah. It makes sense. And then just hopped. Not only that, how many, A, how many rocks could he have possibly shoved in his pockets? And B. To make you heavy enough. That's what I'm saying. That'd be a substantial amount of rocks, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. A fucking rocket, dude. I know how big my pockets are. And I I guarantee you they're considerably bigger than 1800s pockets. (laughs) You got pebbles in your pocket. I'm, I'm still floating. <laughs> it's, it's not working. <laughs> She's a witch. Yeah. Oh, man. The cause of his suicide is said to be his di- uh, dismissal from his post at the Blackheath Boys School. Oh. The reason for his release is unclear. However, one newspaper quoting his brother William's inquest testimony reported being dismissed because he, quote, had gotten to serious trouble. <laughs> there you go. He was diddling. Uh, maybe although it did not specify any further. Several authors have suggested that Druitt may have been dismissed because he was a homosexual or a pederast, and it was illegal back then by the time. Yeah, what? Pederast is such a funny word. I, I hate that word so much. Because it's just like... It's you got, you got it says, pedo and then ass. ass and it, yeah, yeah, it's bad. Don't like it. Another speculation is that the money found in his pocket or on his body, should I say, would be used for payment to a blackmailer. Uh-oh. Or it could have simply been a final payment from the school. A lot of money. Yeah, it could have been his pension or something, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what do they call that when they uh uh, uh money. severance severance pay. Money. Severance pay. Oh, sorry. Like we're getting rid of you. That could see and that could be because they didn't want you know, like, look, you're gay. Let me get you out of here. Right. Here's your buy last off time. money. Here's your last like yeah. four months or whatever. Just go go away. <laughs> Do us a favor. Leave. <laughs> Another possibility involving his dismissal and eventual death is an underlying hereditary psychiatric illness. Oh my. His mother had already attempted suicide once by taking an overdose of laudanum. Good God. She died in an asylum in Chiswick in 1890. In addition, both his grandmother and elder eldest sister committed suicide. Well, his aunt also attempted suicide. Okay, it sounds so like... there's lots of suicides going In on. that family, So, so yeah. now suicide's looking like more plausible. It seems like it. Why would you do it by putting rocks in? You know, I don't know. It's just not how I would do it. Can't, like drowning yourself? That's yeah, just... That sounds one of the worst ways. It's got to be the worst, probably. Yeah. Right? At least there's less cleanup. Yeah, well, no, it's not, man. Decomposing, rotted body fished out of a, the water. That's disgusting. Yeah. So what would be the least? Hanging? Yeah, but I don't know that. I don't. I don't know. I don't want to think about it. Mm. Yeah, that's right. I'm too much of a coward to do it anyway, so it would never matter to me. I, I just, I would, well, first of all, I'd never do it just because, I mean, I have a reason to live and hopefully everyone else does too. Do but <laughs> most days, <laughs> some days, kind of, once in a while. Anyway. You, you know what your reason is? What? You? <laughs> this guy. All right. <laughs> but I, I, I just don't, I'm afraid I'd screw it up. <laughs> Seriously, I'm afraid that I, if I did something, and then what happens if you like, what am I going to be just disabled for the rest of my life? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, that sounds horrible, and that happens all the time. We've talked I, about dude, it numerous times. Yeah, my my father and sister are both paramedics. Yeah, and ugh. they're and I've heard numerous accounts of people fucking that up real bad. That's no, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. 
I'd rather. Just... What we're trying to say is, please, please don't kill yourself. Yeah, please don't attempt to don't kill, kill yourself. Somebody, don't... Get some help. Yeah, get some help. Go. Better help. Better help's awesome right now. Yeah, I wish they were one of our sponsors because they're sponsoring every other podcast out there right now. Well, I mean, we're just some. There's some things we're too good for. That is true. You know? That is true. We're not just every Tom, Dick, and Harry, my friend. That's we, we can lower our rates for them maybe because it is a helpful service. Absolutely. You know, two, three, four thousand <laughs> an episode, right? And let's not go crazy. Maybe seven. All right, I'll, I'll give him a call. <laughs> so a note written by Druitt and addressed to his brother William was found in Druitt's room in Blackheath. It read, quote, Since Friday, I felt that I was going to be like mother, and the best oh. thing for me was to die. Okay, so there's a suicide note. Yeah. There's okay. history of suicide right. in his yeah. family. All right. Let, All let's right. Well, just... I did, we, we didn't get to that part I, I know. I wasn't saying you. I'm saying in general. All right. I'm reiterating. Sure. Okay. The last of the canonical five murders had taken place shortly it's before Drew. It's canonical. Can, it's canonical. Canonical. Can- like pajamas. It's like pajamas. <laughs> so it happened right before he committed suicide. Okay. Following his right death, before. there were no more Ripper murders. Oh. So let's put those two things together. I yeah, I'd like to go back and see how many people died just after they stopped, right. and then you know, let's just accuse all of them. It had to have been him. It had to have been. In 1891, a member of Parliament. <laughs> that's that's from, how they did police work. Right. Then. It had to have been that guy. A member of parliament from West Dorchester. Do- Dor- Dor- Dorster? Dor- Dor- is it Dorster or Dorchester? Is it like Worcester? Worcester? <laughs> Worcester, Mass? Worcester? In England began saying that the Ripper was, quote, the son of a surgeon who had committed suicide on the night of the last murder. All right, oh. so they're speculating here. Assistant Chief Constable Sir Melvin McNaughton, most definitely stretching, named Druitt as a suspect in the case. He did so in a private handwritten memorandum on February 23, 1894. McNaughton highlighted the coincidence between Druitt's disappearance and death shortly after the last of the five murders. He also claimed to have uh, unspecified, quote, private information, one that, quote, <laughs> left little doubt. Yeah, let me guess his girlfriend lived in Ireland, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something. <laughs> that Druitt's own family believed to uh, him to have been the murderer. Oh, Dun dun dun! Yeah. Oh, where is it? Yeah. But let's let's take into account here. The family seems, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Do you really trust the word? Exactly. Of that family? Yeah. They seem a little bit off off kilter here a little bit. So some dudes like like I can make a quick buck. My brother. Yeah. He, he was the guy. <laughs> He's the guy. So the memorandum memorandum read, "Quote: I have always held strong opinions regarding him, and the more I think the matter over, the stronger do these opinions become." The truth, however, will never be known and did indeed at one time lie at the bottom of the Thames in my conjectures to be correct. So McNaughton was convinced. He's convinced, yeah. 100% convinced that Montague John Druitt was the serial killer they had long been looking for. However, he incorrectly described the 31-year-old barrister as a 40, 41-year-old doctor and cited allegations that he was, quote, sexually insane without specifying the source of details of the allegations. Sexually insane. Huh? Sexually insane. Didn't we have that somewhere else, too? We had I'm it in sure. another. I'm sure. I mean, we laughed about it because yeah, it's look, ridiculous. It is ridiculous. McNaughton did not join the force until 1889 after the murder of Kelly and the death of Druitt. He yeah. was also. So he's like doing like what a cold case thing. He was, yeah, he's just kind of. We're like 89. Yeah, it's about a year later. Yeah. He was also not involved in the investigation directly and is likely to have been misinformed. There is also the case of Druid playing cricket games far away from London during many of the murders. Oh, that could boy. kind of add to this. There you go. On September 1st, the day after the murder of Nichols, Druid was in Dorset playing cricket. How um, far away is that, though? Is that is that feasible? I feel like the next day, like, why not? I mean, it's possible. Yeah. On the day of Chapman's murder, however, he played yeah. cricket in Blackheath. Well, I mean, where is that, though? He could have played. It in has to fucking... be close, though, because Blackheath was the school that he got. I mean, he could have he could have played and fucking hopped a... Up to a horse and buggy or some shit, whatever they had back then. Ran. <laughs> he just ran. I gotta go some killing. So the day after the murders of Stride and Eddowes, he was in the West Country defending a client in a court case. Okay, the day after. That's what I'm saying. Like that's Yeah, I mean he put could it's potentially feasible, be there. man. Because yeah, yeah. think about it. Say you say that like Say uh, you say me. <laughs> say it for always. <laughs> say say that you committed a murder at roughly midnight tonight, right? Okay. Right. Okay. Think about how far you could get, and you had to represent a client, say at nine o'clock in court tomorrow morning. Right. So you committed a murder, and you got cleaned up real quick, and you rolled out of town at one o'clock, right, in the morning. Right. 
Think about how far you could get in those next like eight, eight hours, seven and a half, eight hours. Oh yeah, you can get to like, that's Chicago. Yeah, I was gonna say you can get to Chicago. Chicago six. Yeah. yeah, you could get. I mean, you can get up to Wisconsin. You could almost get to fucking New York City. New, New York, York like, City. You know what I'm saying? Like, you get. So, I mean, you could get to Canada. You could be in fucking Canada. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, you get to fucking Toronto from but, here. But that's also five with five hours with an automobile though. Right, but I'm just saying. So let's just say, like, if you had a, a horse. So cut. All right. So yeah. I mean, you're still looking at what, like fucking Toledo or cut Detroit? Cut in half. Yeah, Detroit, Detroit, maybe. Yeah, right. I guess cut it in half. I don't know how freaking I'm fast saying, like, horses dude, are considering. I mean, I mean it, it's possible. It's not a big island, bro. It's possible. It's, <laughs> it's right near the beach. <laughs> Some writers such as Andrew Spalick and Tom Cullen have argued that Drew had had the time and opportunity hey. to travel by train between oh, London fucking trains, man. and his cricket and legal engagements. They went like 40 miles an hour back then. Uh-huh. Easily. Yeah. That was fast. Can we slow this down? <laughs> We're going too fast. He could have even used his city chambers as a base from which to commit the murders. Bam. However, several others have dismissed this claim as improbable. <laughs> See how many things have been improbable, but hey. This entire thing is improbable. Well, yeah. yeah. Lots of things are improbable. It doesn't mean they're not happening. It doesn't mean they're or impossible. Exactly. For instance, Drew, it took three oh. wickets in the match against the Christopherson. The Christopherson brothers at Blackheath on September 8th, the day of the Chapman murder. You took three wickets. Three wickets. Holy shit. And I don't know how many ducks. Wow. I wonder if, do you put the ducks in the wicket? He made like six people duck, dude. Is, is that what that is? I don't know. Is it Wicket, the little dude from Willow? <laughs> no, Wicket is the... That's his name. It's Wicket, isn't it? No, it's fucking Willow. Oh. <laughs> Wicket, Wicket is the uh, Ewok. He's the Ewok. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Played by the guy who was... Who was Willow. Willow. Yeah. That dude played every little guy. I'm giving guy myself ever. one of these. That dude played every little guy ever. I got he it wrong. Willow, he was fucking leprechaun. I'm the leprechaun. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Anyway. So anyway, he did all this stuff. He was on the field at 11 a.m. for the game and performed out of his skin. In other words, I guess he did well. An event unlikely if he were walking the streets of London committing a murder at 5.30 a.m. Not true, bro. Not true. It's called drugs. Drugs? Yeah. Performance enhancing drugs. It could have been just the exhilaration from committing oh, the murder. Could be riding high, man. Adrenaline, you know. Fucking yeah. Dude. Most experts now believe that the killer was local to Whitechapel. On the other hand, Druitt lived miles away on the other side of the, the Thames in oh. Kent. Even Inspector Frederick Aberline appeared to dismiss Druitt as a serious suspect because the only evidence against him was the coincidental timing of his suicide shortly after the last Canonical murders. Yeah. Um, Did I say that right? Close. Okay. Close. Yeah, I think there was like an extra one syllable in there. Okay. Uh, just to just for quick reference. Okay. A duck in cricket is a batsman's dismissal with a score of zero. So I assume it'd be like strike a strikeout out in baseball. Okay, it's a strikeout. So what's a wicket? Wickets those little things that stick up. That they get the the guy who the bowler. I know that that's the guy that throws the thing. Okay. He's got a, he's trying to hit those, and the the guy with the bat is trying to stop him from hitting those. That's all I know. That's about my. Is that how cricket works? Essentially, that's that's like a that's one part of it. So that's basically be like here, like you're. Well, I guess it's kind of the same thing. You're trying to stop the ball to get to the catcher, right? Yeah, I guess. I guess it's just. It'd I don't be know. like if you scored points by getting it to the catcher. That's weird. But yeah, I, I don't want to play. That's that. like the only thing about cricket that I kind of know. I was good at baseball. I loved baseball. I still love baseball, except the Guardians. Aww. Well, they scored like 19, 17 runs. Yesterday. <laughs> I know they killed it yesterday. Who they play? Detroit. Uh no, uh Royals. Royals, okay. City. We could be Royals. All right, so now we're on to the next guy here. This is Aaron Kosminski. Not oh, to be Aaron confused Kosminski. with a guy later whose last name is like Karminski. Yeah, we get we'll get into it. We'll get into it. I think I think we talk about yeah. it. So Aaron Kosminski was not a stable man. <laughs> In eighteen ninety one he was sent good start. Yeah, he was sent to Colney Hatch Asylum. Oh, Psychi- okay. psychiatric reports made uh, during Kosminski's time there state that Kosminski heard auditory hallucinations oh. that directed him to do things. So he was schizo. Schizo, yeah. Although some claim that Kosminski wasn't violent, there is a record of him threatening his own sister with a knife. Definitely schizo. Yes. The canonical five murders, which wrapped up the hey. sum of the Ripper's. Yes, I got it right. Yeah. Okay. Of the, I'm just going to call him the Ripper Five. Can I do that? You could do whatever you want, but Thanks. it's your world. We're just living in it. That's right. So it wrapped up uh, up the sum of the Ripper's official kills. Um, it stopped soon after Kosminski was put into an asylum. So another one where, uh, oh, he's put uh, away. Present-day doctors think Kosminski might have been a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh-huh. Like oh, you said, I'm not yeah. laughing at that. I'm saying because you got yeah, it right. We yeah. got it. Dude, we've been doing this long enough. Yeah, I'm just listeners here. I just don't want to ever 
think I, I'm making no, fun I of know. mental no, illness. No, definitely not. No, I You're mentally do. ill. Yes, it is. I documented. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I also remember I have minimal brain dysfunction. This is... <laughs> <laughs> you do, yeah. I have the paper showing that I have it. <laughs> but it is sure is suspicious that his institutionalization fits the timeline of Jack the Ripper. Uh-oh. I mean, is it? Has Minsky <laughs> threatened his sister with a knife? Again, I wonder how many people you could go by right. and say that to. Jack the Ripper is infamous for the violent way he murdered his female victims. The serial killer did things like slashing throats, removing organs, and severely disfiguring faces. Yeah. The crimes he committed were grisly and suggested a severe hatred of women. By the way, out of all these, I have one, I think, maybe our guy. Yeah? Yeah. I have one out okay. of all these, I okay. think, and, and I'm, I'm, when we get to him, we'll I talk about it. can't wait to hear it. I have one that I think we, that maybe our guy, but I also have a theory as well. So we'll talk. Just so, so let me, let me ask you a question though. Yeah. All these guys are dead, right? I would sure hope so. So you have a theory of a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yes! All right. I love that you have no idea that they're coming either. <laughs> I want to hit you right now for that one. I just love that you just uh, don't. I set it up and you just have no idea that it's coming. Isn't that the guy that sings like, my girlfriend or whatever the song is? I don't know. They're, or is that the, I no. like my pants around my pants? Oh, my. Is that who that is? No. no that's, that's Nickel Creek. That's no, wait. That's Nickel Nickelback. Creek. Whatever. I don't know. I don't listen to this thing. <laughs> Anyway, they had one like real big song, I think. Yeah. So Kaminsky threatened his sister with a knife, like we mentioned. Jack the Ripper is infamous for doing all these horrible things. They're fucking Canadian. Uh, yeah, of course they are. God damn it. Kaminsky definitely fits the description of hating women because he literally like suggested that he hated women. He was terrible <laughs> at socializing okay. with women. And according to Chief Constable Melvin McNaughton, that guy again, he was known for his profound resentment of women. McNaughton wrote, quote, This man became insane due to indulgence in solitary vices for many years. He had a great hatred of women, especially of the prostitute class, and had strong homicidal tendencies. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Hating prostitutes and I mean, suspected of being capable of murder. So. Why not? Yep. Yeah, Kazminsky is looking better and better as the chief Jack the Ripper suspect, right? Sounds pretty good. I mean, out of the two so, so far. So far, yeah. I mean, he sounds pretty right. good. On the night of one of the murders, a woman named Elizabeth Long said she heard the man's voice who led Jack the uh, led Jack the Ripper victim, Annie Chapman, to her death. Long said she listened to the man ask Annie, will you, as they were discussing their sex work arrangement. Long described the man's voice as having an accent. Okay. Oh. We, he's not for those parts, I would assume. No. Kosminski, as a Polish Jew, had an accent. Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay. A clue left on a Golston Street wall in London suggested that Jack Ripper had a native language other than English as well. The person who wrote the message spelled the word Jews, J-U-W-E-S, instead of Jews, J-E-W-S. The entire statement read, quote, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. It was never understood what was actually meant by it. And so, wait a minute. If you're a Polish Jew, why would you... That was messed up. Why would you... Right, Jew, J U W E S, as opposed to J E. Wouldn't you know how to spell Jews? Or would you? I don't. I don't know. Maybe that was just like a uh, maybe that's how a they slang or something maybe like that. That's how they it. All right. What's uh, more, what's what? What do you got? Can I? Can I just? Please don't tell me anything about Theory of a Dead Man. <laughs> no, it is. Oh, damn it. I, the only reason is because I was trying to figure out what their big song was. What it kept it? coming up saying a song called "Bad Girlfriend." Yeah, that's the one I was talking about. I thought. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Because there's nothing about the pants around. The, I know what you're talking about. No, that was Nickelback. This one starts off, my girlfriend's a dick magnet. <laughs> my girlfriend got to have it. She's hot. Can't stop. Up on stage doing shots. Tip the man. He'll ring the bell. Get her drunk. She'll scream like hell. And they probably sold, uh, probably, I'm going to say, what, a million, two million copies? Grab her ass. Oh. Acting tough. Ooh. Mess with her. She'll fuck you up. I feel like there's a lot of dysfunction in their relationship. It doesn't sound good, man. Wow. Yeah. But what's more, McNaughton wrote this about a suspect spotted fleeing on the night of Catherine Edo's oh. murder. All right. Quote, this man in appearance strongly resembled the individual seen by the city PC near oh. Miter Square. Is this Melville again? Uh, yes. Oh, he's he, still around. He's back in action, yeah. Okay. Here to guess who uh, the individual seen by the city PC was? Who the guy McNaughton's referring to? Kleminski. It's Kosminski, but yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> he was talking about Aaron Kosminski. Oh. Although reports of Jack the Ripper's appearance in general were inconsistent, Kosminski fit the appearance of someone spotted at one of the crime scenes. McNaughton's okay. report has been discredited, though, so, you know, just take the information as you will here. Fucking so, Melville. Yeah. What's he doing? In 2017, uh, a man named Russell Edwards wanted to confirm the identity of Jack the Ripper so right. so severely that he acquired the shawl of Jack the Ripper victim, Catherine Eddowes. What that cost him? I mean, was it still in one piece? Yeah, sure. I'm sure it was preserved somewhere. Oh, man. Yeah, it would be nice to find out how much that actually cost so he had Shaw's DNA tested, or the Shaw's DNA tested, and confirmed that the genetic material on the Shaw traced back to one of Kosminski's living relatives. Wow. 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 <laughs> wow. So yeah. For fighters. For fighters. <laughs> Just finished up that research for that yeah. Icons episode. Good. Oh, there's, there's as much information there as there is on Jack the Ripper. I'm it's, sure there oh, is. Yeah, it's insane. So, yes, yeah, so he, they apparently it traced back. So, Edwards had written a book entitled Naming Jack the Ripper, thus having something to gain. So, people didn't believe his analysis. Oh, so sure. He, Everyone's probably, oh, of course he's going to get back because that's right. what you wanted it to be. That is until the DNA was studied by an unrelated peer reviewed oh, science journal. Really? Yep. In 2019, okay. the Journal of Forensic Sciences Sounds confirmed important. that the DNA did indeed match Aaron Kosminski. Oh, so they're, they're doubling down on that shit. Right, and it's an outside. No, it was definitely Klamarski. Sure. The results were apparently sketchy and not tested again until 2019 by Liverpool John Moore's University and the University of Leeds. Oh, the DNA DNA presented uh, presented matched. What the DNA? Pre- <laughs> it matched the descendants of Kuzminski and Edo. So that's three. Yeah, three. That's that's wow. Yeah. Now, here's the crazy part that Shaw was never documented in police custody. How do they know that it's apparently it was found? And I don't know, maybe they just didn't took it, take it into evidence or whatever it was. Yeah, I guess. And then point, somebody I, referred you know, to I guess it. So at the same time, like, what the fuck are they going to get out of it back then? Because well, yeah, they didn't have DNA. They had no idea you know, what DNA know was, was. But I mean, still, like, blood there's and some stuff. stuff on this thing over here. Should we keep it? Nah, just burn it or something. So that one sounds pretty legit so far. That's, I mean, yeah, that's. I mean, if you actually have trace evidence of somebody's, you know, yeah, their freaking descendants <clears throat> on yeah. this. I mean, I'm just saying. So it had his and Catherine Eddowes? Correct. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Yep, which is, uh, you know. But you know what? I mean, she was a prostitute and he was there. <laughs> yeah, I guess we don't know what kind you of material is on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on, Francis Craig. Francis. Francis. Yeah. Anyone calls me Francis, <laughs> i kill you. Sit down, Francis. Born in 1837 in Acton, West London, Francis Spurtzheim Craig. Craig! His middle name is Spurtzheim. Spurtz? Spurtzheim. I'm going to Spurtzheim! <laughs> oh, that's his name, Spurtzheim. <laughs> Shall we hang out later? He was the son of a well-known Victorian social reformer. His father, E.T. Craig, was a writer and advocate of phrenology. E.T. E. Craig. E. Craig, yeah. Oh, no. Why would you go by E? Like, regard, obviously, the movie. Decades away. Right. Why the foot? His name's whatever. probably like Edmund Thaddeus. Why would you go like Y E T? Like that's not even a good flowing. It wasn't Y E T. Like it's not like D J. It was E T, not Y E T. T J. T B J. My name's B J. <laughs> your name's Blowjob. <laughs> just, just kidding out there. If your name happens to be B J, I'm sorry <laughs> that your mother named you that. Anyway. So, he was an advocate of phrenology, interpreting personality types by feeling the shape of the head, a so-called science at this time. All right. And it was... Where's BJ? (laughs) Here he's good at feeling the shape of a head, huh? (laughs) hey (laughs) oh. However, the family moved into influential West London circles, counting William Morris, the socialist and founder of the arts and crafts movement, among others. So they're hanging around hoity yeah, apparently. Yes. The same William Morris? I don't think that would be the same William no. Morris. Yeah. Greg, like his father, was a journalist, Greg? but not a successful one. <laughs> Friends described him as a sens- a sensitive yet stubborn. Oh. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to move. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I'm sensitive. Quit poking me. No, I'm not going to help you. I'll quit, quit it. Quit poking me. It hurts. No, I'm not going to help you. After a period in, United, in the United States from 1864 oh. to 1866, 
Craig spent some time in local newspapers, but in the 1871 census, listed himself as a person of no occupation. Oh, okay. okay. By 1875, he had been appointed editor of the Bucks Advertiser in Aylesbury News. Hey, well, he's got a job now. Right. Things are good. Here, Craig's journalism career suffered an almost terminal blow when, oh, he, was no. ca- when he was caught ribbing reports from the Daily Telegraph and was brutally exposed as a plagiarist by a rival publication. Can't wow. do that. Wow. Can't do that. Wow. Yeah. Cribbing report. Cribbing. I like it. Cribbing. I left. Yeah, I thought that was good. I want to believe that. I learned a new word today. Cribbing. Cribbing. Yes. It's like a crib sheet. And wicket. You know what I mean? I know what a wicket is now. You do. Get wicket. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So it is not known how he met Elizabeth Weston Davies. Oh. It Who is uh, Elizabeth Weston Davies? Well, it's uh, his soon-to-be wife. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Just a few months later, on May 19th, 1885, she was seen entering a private hotel near the marital home oh, in Argyle Square, King's Cross, with a young man at Argyle 10 o'clock. Argyle Square. Okay, so do you hear what we uh, said there? A young man in Argyle Square. Who was not our boy Cray. It wasn't Spart time. <laughs> right, it wasn't Spart. Maybe his middle name just freaked her out. You should see that he Spart times everywhere. No. So the book says it was a crushing blow for Craig, who, oh, I bet, dude. who had been unaware of his wife's involvement in prostitution. She wasn't just cheating. How do you not? Well, right, whatever. I mean, this is the 1890s. Yeah. yeah. She left and went into hiding in the East End under the pseudonym of. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh that means something good's coming. Mary Jane Kelly. Oh, yeah. no way. One of the Ripper victims. The most famous. Yeah. In The Real Mary Kelly, uh, the book, author Wynne Weston Davies, I'm Weird. assuming is related, suggests Craig suffered from a mental illness named schizotypal personality disorder. Mm-hmm. Okay. Craig followed her to Whitechapel, taking okay. lodgings at 306 Mile End Road. All right. He tried to locate the only woman he had ever loved. And as time passed, his love for her turned to hatred. Oh, he usually does. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> He's kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he tried to locate her and he couldn't. Then he plotted to murder her, disguising his involvement by killing a series of prostitutes beforehand, the book suggests. Oh. Seems like kind of a leap to get to one person, but whatever. A few months after the murder of Elizabeth and Mary Jane, Craig left the East End and returned to West London as editor of the Indicator and West London News, a job he held until 1896. Oh, good for him. Yeah, he held that job for yeah. a little while then. In 1903, while living in lodgings at Carthu Road, Hammersmith, oh. Craig cut his throat with a razor. Oh, my. Leaving his landlady a note which read, quote, I have suffered a deal of pain and agony. Sorry for the mess. Yeah. Well, he didn't die. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, until four days later. Oh. Okay. Imagine four days of just bleeding out. Yeah. Ooh. That's a shit job of cutting your throat. Yeah. Because that doesn't take much. As long as you hit that artery. You just got to get in just deep enough to go pick and yeah. nick that artery, man. Yeah, you can barely nick that and you can bleed out. So Yeah, dude. So he died on Sunday, March 8th, 1903. And in an inquest, the coroner recorded a verdict of, quote, suicide whilst of unsigned, unsound mind and when irresponsible for his actions. So he was crazy. Is right. Was yeah. He had mental dif- difficulties here. Yeah. And yeah. Dr. Weston Davies plans to exhume Elizabeth Mary Jane's body. To carry out DNA analysis, which he believes yeah. will show the true identity of the Ripper's final victim and therefore prove Craig's motive for the murders. God damn. Right. So there, there's Craig Spootson. Craig? Craig. Whatever his name is. Next up, we have Carl F- Feigenbaum. Carl Feigenbaum. You know, to me, so you look at some of these names. Like and it. so back in the day, yeah. you know, if someone's last name was Smith, they were probably they were a Smith. They were a Smith. And if they were a carpenter, they were... Carpenter. Bill Carpenter. Right. His is Feigenbaum. He was a Feigenbaum. Right. Or a Fingerbaum. <laughs> was he the Duke of Fingerbaum? He may have been. <laughs> this may have been where it came from. He might be the Duke of Fingerbaum. Right. Carl Feigenbaum was most yeah, certainly a convicted murderer. Oh, my. So okay. fuck this guy. Off to a good start. Indeed, he was convicted of and executed for the murder of Mrs. Juliana Huffman, a 56-year-old uh, widow who lived in two rooms above a shop at four, uh, 544 East 6th Street, New York. With her 16-year-old son, Michael. New York City. <laughs> New York City. Feigenbaum told the Hoffmans that he had lost his job as a gardener and therefore had no money. Oh. However, he assured them that he had been promised a job as a florist and that Ooh. once he was paid on September uh, 1st, 
It's a Saturday. 1894, he would be able to pay them the rent that he owed. First of the month. Right. That's right. <laughs> wake up, wake up. The Hoffmans took him at his word, a trust that would prove fatal wow. for Mrs. Hoffman. Oh, nice lady. Yeah, well, it's... Uh, as a consequence of their having a lodger who was given the rear of the uh, two rooms, mother and son shared the front room. Okay, so he was in the back, they were up front. Yeah, yeah. Juliana was sleeping in the bed, and Michael uh, occupying a couch at the foot of the bed. Okay. Okay. Which is good. They weren't in the same bed together. That's weird. Shortly after midnight in the early hours of September 1st, 1894, Michael was woken by a scream, and looking across to his mother's bed, he saw their lodger, the guy staying with them, and leaning over her bed, with a knife in hand, Michael lunged at fi- a fi- finger bum, who turned around and came at him with the knife. Realizing he would be no match against an armed man, Michael escaped out of a window and began screaming for help. Help! <laughs> help! <laughs> Looking through the window, Michael watched in horror as Feigenbaum stabbed his mother in the neck and then cut her throat, Jesus. severing the jugular. Juliana made one final attempt yeah, to defend herself. That could have used his help. I know. That's, I was just thinking the same thing. That's where my, that's where my head went. Yeah. Juliana made one final attempt to defend herself and advanced toward her attacker, but she collapsed and fell to the floor. So she was a fighter to the end. Yeah, she was going out. Yeah. She was going out swinging. Fingerbomb then returned to his room. He escaped out of the window, climbed down into the yard, and washed his hands at the pump. He then made his way out into the alleyway that led to the street. So how did his name become linked to the Whitechapel murders? That's the question I have. Yes. So in a nutshell, look at me. I'm in a nutshell. <laughs> this is me in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He reputedly confessed to having been Jack the Ripper shortly before his execution. Oh, of so course. he straight up said, yes. I'm fucking Jack the Ripper. Yeah, but can you really trust deathbed confessions? I, I mean, they're, deathbed, they're taken as legal. Yeah, like legally binding. Yeah. Which is weird that you would do that to somebody. At, I mean, if because you're they dying. Think, but that's the thing. They feel like most people have that on their conscience. They're trying to clear their conscience before they die. Yeah, but I feel like most so they people. Take that as like a legally binding. As they're dying, I don't feel like they're mentally. So, so okay, let me put it, it this way. it depends on the person. Let me put it this way. Like, if they're already mentally unstable, then, yeah, well, who knows? Right. You but can't. If it's like you or me or like any of our wonderful listeners. Right. Who are clearly the sanest people on the planet. Uh, obviously. Uh, they, they just take that as like. I mean, that's just like when you're on your deathbed, when you know you're about to die, it's like you just want people to know, like, look, this is everything that fucking, this is it, man. So your final word in confession can be used as a legally binding yeah. Um, yeah, confession, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yet you can't, when you're dying like that, uh, like kill yourself legally or have somebody else assist you in that. Well, well no, because clearly, clearly you're in a uh, terrible state of mind to, At to that make point. that decision. Right. But, but. Definitely a a uh, a good enough state of mind that you could be used to like convict a killer or something. Okay, yeah. okay, Absolutely. I'm glad you uh, cleared that up for me. Yeah, just so you know, that's okay. that's worth it. Right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it is noticeable that the British press didn't pay much attention to the trial of Carl Fingerbum until following his execution. One of his lawyers made an eleventh hour confession public. Oh, yeah. Suddenly, articles about his confession began appearing in British newspapers. One of which was the following report, Let's which appeared in Reynolds newspaper on Sunday. The, uh, May 3rd, 1896. Oh, that before they made Reynolds wrap, uh, the cling wrap? Uh, they, they did newspapers? Maybe. Maybe that's what they wrapped everything. Well, they did wrap everything in that. Oh. Maybe they were like, this newspaper ain't doing shit. Yeah. So they made plastic. Yeah. Yeah. And the world's been a better place ever since. God, we're just out here doing God's work. I know, we? dude. Just information out the just ass. bringing it to people. Right. So this confession here, it says, quote, an impression based on an 11th hour confession and other evidence prevails that Carl Fingerbum, who was executed at Sing Sing on Monday, the real murderer Sing of, Sing. of the New York outcast, nicknamed Shakespeare, is possibly Jack the Ripper of oh Whitechapel my. notoriety. Oh. The proofs, however, are far from positive. Okay. Proofs are far from positive. Right. Birds, they ain't got shit to say that. A week later on Sunday, May 10th, 1896, Lloyd's Weekly Newspaper published, published a... Uh, more detailed account of the uh, confession. This is Christopher just, Lloyd's newspaper. Just have like, <laughs> yeah, everyone's got their own paper. I was gonna say it's just like people doing like, like Bill's newspaper. <laughs> yeah, it's like when they didn't have like big like conglomerates of fucking yeah. news. You These know, are whatever guys that do this in their basement and put out news. Yeah, saying. like Lloyd's newsletter. Someone it's comes like and the tells original, them to gossip, original, like fanzines. And yeah. Shit. <laughs> so he published a, a more, or they published a more detailed account of the confession, which had been made to his lawyer, William Stanford Lawton. Okay. And it says, "Let's hear it." Quote: The American Jack the Ripper, Carl Fingerbum, 
it's fake and bomb, whatever, who was executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing last week is reported to have left a remarkable confession with his lawyer. The account of the lawyer reads, I have a statement to make, which may throw some light on the murder for which the man I represented was executed. Now that Feigenbaum is dead and nothing more can be done for him in this world, I want to say as his counsel that I am absolutely sure of his guilt in this case, and I feel morally certain that he is the man who committed many, if not all, of the Whitechapel murders. Here are my reasons, and on this statement, I pledge my honor. So this is like an actual statement from... So not only is the his attorney saying, listen, he was guilty as shit for this murder that he got executed for, but I also feel like he's guilty of those murders. Well, at least some, if not all. Right. Which leads me to my speculation the whole thing. Anyway, he goes on to say, when Fe- Feigenbaum was in the <laughs> tombs awaiting trial, I'm assuming that's jail, right? Yeah, yeah. I saw him several times. The evidence in this case seemed so clear that I cast about uh, for a theory of insanity. Certain actions denoted a decided mental weakness somewhere. When I asked him point blank, did you kill Mrs. Hoffman? He made this reply. I have for years suffered from a singular disease, which induces an all-absorbing passion. This passion manifests itself in a desire to kill and mutilate the women who falls in my way. At such times, I am una- unable to control myself. So he confessed that he has the, this... Yeah. This uncontrollable urge to kill. to kill women. Yeah. On my next visit to the tombs, I asked him whether he had not been in London at various times during the whole period covered by the Whitechapel murders. Answer, yes, I was. I asked him whether he could not explain some of these cases on the theory which he had suggested to me, and he simply looked at me in reply. The statement, which is a long one, proves conclusively that Feigenbaum was more or less insane, but the evidence of his identity with the notorious Whitechapel criminal is not satisfactory. There you go. All right, so he's... So what do we think? I I mean, if he said it, and the lawyer clearly isn't out for any recognition or money, then it's got (laughs) to be. It's got to be true, right? (laughs) His his, uh, telltale book will be out later in the the year. Yeah, Tell-all book, whatever it's called. He's got nothing to gain from this, right? Mm. Oh. Right, you're only the attorney of of Jack the Ripper. Sure. Right. Well, of course, many disagree with this and do not believe the confession. In truth, there is no compelling evidence to suggest that Lawton may have been lying about what his client had told him, and it might just have been that Feigenbaum may have thought that in confessing to the Whitechapel murders, it would buy him a little extra time. Oh, because then people wanted to be talking to they him. They would talk to him, him investigate it more, on. and see, you know, and it, it didn't work, and his ass just got executed. So, oh, I bitch. Next one up here, we have the English painter Walter Sickert. Yeah, so this is the one that I, I get a lot of people Walt. talking about. The the painter. Everyone's Walt. like, the painter. Yes, Walt Sickert. Walt. Okay. The name of Walter Sickert has been linked to the Jack the Ripper murders by several mm. authors. Oh. However, his role in the killings has been said to have varied enormously over the years. Okay. According to some authors, he was an, an accomplice in the Whitechapel murders. Uh-huh. You hear that? An uh-huh. accomplice... Okay. While others depicted him as knowing who was responsible for the crimes and duly informing them. Duly noted. Yes. But according to the crime novelist Patricia Cornwell in her 2002 book, Portrait of a Killer, Jack the Ripper Case Closed, which, by the way, I out of all the authors so far, she's the one I want to punch right in the mouth the most. Is it because her name is Cornwall? No. Nope. It's not it. Just, uh, oh. you'll see. Okay. She says in her book, Sickert was, in fact, the man who carried out the crimes that became known as the Jack the Ripper murders. According to Cromwell's theory, Walter Sickert had been made impotent by a series of painful childhood operations for a fistula of the penis. The fuck is a fistula? It's a... a, a, um, like Like a tumor, almost. Yeah. He had a penis tumor? Yeah. He had a dick tumor. A fistula? Yeah. What the fuck kind of... All right. Look it up. I don't know. Do you want to look that up? I'm, I mean, I hope I don't get any crazy pictures. I'm <laughs> this, sure I'm going to, though. This impotence had scarred him emotionally and had left him with a pathological hatred of women, which in time led him to carry out the series of murders in the East End of London. This is her theory, by the way, folks. It's true. Huh? Doubts were raised about her theory when it was pointed out that St. Mark's Hospital, where the operations on the young Sickert were supposedly performed. You ready for this? Specialized in rectal and not genital fistulas. <laughs> so butts, not nuts. Would you like to know what an anal fistula is? Because I got it right here. I kind of don't. It's an infected tunnel between the skin and the anus. So what the fuck is a penis fistula? 
I don't know, regular, uh, an, uh, there's arter, ar, uh, arteria, I hope you guys aren't eating right now. <laughs> arteriovenous fistula is an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein. An obstetric fistula is an abnormal connection between the rectum and the vagina. A what? An abnormal connection. Abnormal. What is it? Like uh, a, a freaking fork in the road? Like, is this, does that happen? It says fistula is an abnormal connection between two body parts, such as an organ or blood vessel and another structure. Usually the result of an injury or surgery. Infection or inflammation can also cause a fistula to form. Okay, so it's like a, a blood clot, basically. Right? It's like know. a clot. It well, is, whatever. It's an abnormal connection between organs, bro. Okay, I'm All sorry. Right? Take the other route. Jeez. Jeez. So, yeah, it's butts, not nuts. And, of course, so what does that mean here? Well, what evidence is there to suggest that Sickert possessed a pathological hatred of women? On top of that, okay? Again, not shit, really. In a Portrait of a Killer, Cornwell cites a series of Sickert's paintings inspired by the murder in 1908 of a Camden Town prostitute by Emily Dimmick. According to Patricia Cornwell's hypothesis, the series of pictures bears a striking resemblance to the post-mortem photographs of the victims of Jack the Ripper. So she's saying that he's painting these paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're of... They resemble the crime scene. Crime scenes, right. right. But uh, but they resemble the, the photographs of the crime scenes. So he could have seen the photographs, not necessarily been there to replicate what he did or saw. Correct? Sure, okay. sure. Now, there is little doubt that Sickert was fascinated by murder. Not, I think there was only that one picture of, of one of the crime scenes. There's numerous pictures. Of the crime scene? Well, there's the there's that one, like, the famous one or whatever that was, like, considered the first, like... Uh, the one where she was disemboweled? The first crime scene photo, yeah. Mm. And that was, that was, so I'm, that's what I'm, and that was the last murder. So I'm saying, like, those first couple murders, there weren't really any pictures of them, I don't think. No, I'm just going by what this says. It says striking resemblance to the post-mortem photographs. Okay. So maybe there could have been one. I don't know. Oh, post-mortem. That could have been the pictures of the, that could have been them in the fucking morgue, though. Right, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, it, literally, it could have been freaking... I thought, okay, I thought Anywhere. you were talking like strictly crime scene. No, okay. no, po- post-mortem. Post-Malone. Post-Mortimer? Post-Mortimer Malone. Yes. Now, again, there's little doubt that he was fascinated by murder and finding different ways to depict the menace of the crime and the criminal by his paintings. He was into that stuff. I mean, he was a dark dude. A lot of people like that. But to cite this as evidence so he that he emo. was... huh? He was emo. He was emo before emo was emo. Right. Yeah. But the, to say that, uh, you know, any of this evidence makes him an actual murderer and specifically the murderer who carried out the Jack the Ripper killings is it's not proof. You know what I mean? Well, no. Right. So, so as you passengers more than likely know, uh, when looking at a particular Jack the Ripper suspect or any murder suspect, you need to be able to link your suspect to the crime. You do. Right. It, that would help. Yes. You need to example, you know, um, for example, be able to place them at the scene of the crime. Also helpful. Yes. Correct. Here again, the case against Sickert unravels slightly since evidence suggests that he may not even have been in England when the murders were committed. Okay. Yeah, many letters from several family members refer to him vacationing in France for a period corresponding to most of the Ripper murders. Although it's been suggested that he might have traveled to London to commit the murders and then return back to France, he come from France, no evidence has been produced to indicate that he did so. Okay. Hornwell also contends that Sickert was responsible for writing most of the Jack the Ripper correspondence oh. and frequently uses statements made in those letters to strengthen her case against him. Oh, all right. Authorities on the case and the police at the time, nearly all of them, share the opinion that none of the letters, not even the dear boss, you know, crazy letter that gave him his name, was the work of one killer. Okay. okay. So they're saying no, none of the Jack the Ripper... Um, Letters or whatever, they everyone says that they don't look like they come from the same person. Okay. Right. So, in addition, there is the problem that the style of the letters varies so significantly in grammatical structure, spelling, and handwriting that it is almost impossible for a single author to have created all of them. There you go. Right? Sure. In her quest to prove Sickert's guilt, like, she just really wanted this. That's why I don't like her. It's like none of her shit, not even remotely well, it's sticks. The whole, it's the whole thing of, like, you're going to find the answers where you want to find the answers. Right. However... She uh, she did fund DNA tests uh, on numerous stamps and envelopes, which she she believed that Sickert had licked and compared the DNA to that found on the Ripper letters. Interestingly, a possible match was found with the stamp on the Doctor Openshaw letter. Oh, yeah. 
Critics, however, have pointed out that the DNA comparisons focused on mitochondrial DNA, which could be shared by anything from between 1% to 10% of the population, so it was hardly u- unique to Sickert. In other words, they could have had the same mitochondrial DNA yeah. components. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. yeah. So whatever. Fuck off. <laughs> the last character. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. Out of all those that we just discussed, that one right there, I'm like, come on, lady. Come on. She's, again, stretch. Stretch. Very stretch. stretch. Yes. So the last characters are generally considered the top sus. The ones we just talked about are the top suspects in those the, are the ones the case. That you see most people like. Oh, it was this guy? Oh, it had right. to be this guy. And you've probably heard of them, or they pop up on all the documentaries. Yeah, yeah. However, that hasn't stopped many others from being implicated. There's been several, including known serial killers <laughs> and even yes, royalty. I apologize for my coughing. I've got a little uh, phlegm action going in my throat today. Yeah, you got a frog in your throat? No, no, I don't. You like fish sticks? <laughs> All right, so first up, H.H. H. Holmes, which I referenced him at it's, our it's, last episode. It's Holmes. Holmes. It's Holmes. Holmes. The H.H. H. goes. Oh, is that what it does? Yes. I didn't know that. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> he is known as America's first serial killer, but some believe America was not his only hunting ground. Mm. And this is another one of those stretches. Jeff Mudge. It is, but it might not be. Yeah, I know, no. but there's just a lot, of, and we will talk about it. Jeff Mudge, a lawyer and former commander in the U.S. Naval Reserve, all right, claims that his great great grandfather, H. H. Holmes, was ready a really nice guy, and he loved him a lot. That's what I was heard. That's what I heard, man. No, he thought he was Jack the oh, Ripper. He oh. says he's you Jack the Ripper. Did there, I get, they have pulled you your leg. Me. You got they have me. pulled your chain. <laughs> Mudgett bases his assertions on the writings in two diaries he inherited from Holmes, which detail Holmes' par- uh, his participation in the murder and mutilation of numerous prostitutes in London. Mudgett also claims that the man who died in the public hanging on May 7th, 1896, was not his great-great-grandfather, I H. Never, H. Holmes. I never knew about that. There was Apparently, there was... a. Uh, there's like speculation, the conspiracy theory, yeah. but as we'll see later on, yeah, there, there's there's speculation. Well, t- no, well, not anymore. Well, well yeah, there there was, yeah. There's all kinds of speculation. Just read. I'm sorry, but rather a man that Holmes tricked into going to the gallows oh. in his place. Wow. Travel document documentation documentation. <laughs> I'm making up my own words over here. And witness the accounts. Documentation my docu- states. My documentation says this, Your Honor. <laughs> I would be recluse. <laughs> In denying my improbability. Was that, was that a living color? I think so. It was, yeah. yeah, it was uh, Keenan Ivory Way. And yeah. He was the lawyer. He would, yeah. Or there was like three of them and they would talk back yeah. and forth. Yeah. I would be toilet to let you know. I don't know. Sorry. Anyway. So travel documentation, not documentation, and witness accounts also lend themselves to the theory that Jack the Ripper and Holmes are the same. Oh. And there's some... The biggest issue with Holmes and the Ripper being the same psychopathic man is that one was in Chicago and the other in London when international travel was not easy. You know, it wasn't. You pretty much had to take a boat to go anywhere. An old, old wooden ship. An old wooden ship. <laughs> no, Ron, that's not right. Um, which could take about a month oh. to go either one way or the other. So, Can't you be on a fucking boat for a month just to get from... God damn, I was dude. on for a week and I just wanted to die. However, with the Ripper killings ending in early 1889 and the first Holmes killings at the end of 1889, the timeline is entirely possible. Oh, yeah. see, he could do it. It is recorded that a passenger by the name of H. Holmes traveled oh. from the UK to the US at that time. Oh. Holmes is a pretty popular last name, and H. H. Holmes' legal name was actually Herman Webster Mudgett. Right, correct, correct. Right. In addition, based on accounts and descriptions of Jack the Ripper, multiple sketch artists were able to come up with a drawing of Jack, which looked eerily similar to H.H. H. Holmes. However, oh. another account describes Jack the Ripper as having, quote, brown eyes and brown hair, which could really be anyone. That covers a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> Experts deny that H.H. H. Holmes and Jack the Ripper are the same person because they had different motives. Okay. Yeah. Which sure. we don't necessarily know what... Right, Jack's motives, motives were. were. We know what Holmes's were. Yeah, he was killing for money. If he existed. Anyway. Ugh. <laughs> this guy. While Jack the Ripper typically went after poor women who were sex workers, seeming like he just hated them, H.H. H. Holmes was naturally after money. And boy, was he. Yeah, but if you're going after prostitutes, you're assuming that they got some money on them, right? 
Yeah, well, I guess not, not not as much as what Holmes was. Holmes was going after like life insurance, inheritances. And yeah, stuff. yeah, but still, he actually you basically. Gotta start off, hey, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, he basically started the whole uh, life insurance scam thing. Oh yeah, yeah, he's a he was super smart, man. I had to give the guy credit. He was. He was a horrible human smart. being if he existed. But oh my God, with you, he was super smart. He was adept at moving accounts and signing life insurance over to his many aliases. In addition. He would try to find people disconnected from family or else murder entire families and siblings to take their inheritances. Yeah, if you're going to kill one, you got to kill them all. Right. Got to kill them all. Right. Of the deniers of the theory here, Jeff Mudgett, the great-great-grandson who's trying to do this, he says, quote, there are too many coincidences for this to be another bogus theory. Goes on to say, I know that the evidence is out there to prove my theory and I'm not going to give it up until I find it. Now, except for those diaries that he claims to have, Right. Hey, there was a series that he did. It's called like American Ripper. Yeah. Or something like that. I haven't watched it. I, I but he was I behind the, that series, I guess. Yeah. Well, he actually refuses to show those quote unquote diaries to anyone. Oh. He, even going as far as to not print pictures of them in his book that he put out. His excuse for this is that it's a quote, technically evidence and it could be confiscated by law enforcement because there is no statute of limitations on murder. But if you had something that substantial. There's no statute. Okay, I get there's no statute of limitations. It was fucking 1888, dude. It's not like they're going to put the guy on fucking trial. Exactly. I, 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 that's what I'm saying. Even if he committed the murders the day he was born, he'd be 120 years old. Yeah. I, I, again, I don't know. I think he's full of shit, too, but that's just me. But, I mean, there are a lot of... 140 years There are a lot of, you know, again, thin. <laughs> yeah. Thin, I mean, thin. I mean that he's... there's. I, I feel like that's more plausible than a couple of the other guys we've already talked that about. That chick with the book earlier. Ugh. <laughs> I just don't like her. Anyway, next up on our list is Prince Albert. I would, I would fight her. I would. I wouldn't hit her till she hit me. Anyway, oh, I'm wow. kidding, kidding, wow. kidding. I'm sorry. Wow, I'm kidding. <laughs> Prince Albert Victor there, is our next guy. Ooh, Will. No, never mind. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> Prince Albert Victor, the guy with the uh, dick uh, jewelry name here. Everyone loves a conspiracy theory, and there me have too. been. A, this one's actually. I like this one. I don't think it's the one. No, there's a lot of holes posted. Yeah, in this one, I think. but I like this one as yeah, a, fun. as a, a yeah as a theory. It's, I mean, I guess as fun as murder conspiracy, right? <laughs> the conspiracy itself. So uh, there have been few better conspiracy theories than the theory of Prince Albert Victor impregnating a shop girl named Annie Crook. Obviously, the royal family had Queen Victoria's physician, Doctor Gull, brutalize her at a mental institution until she forgot everything. She then left the illegitimate child with a prostitute, um, Mary Kelly, oh. who blabbed about the relationship to her friends, who were also prostitutes. Of course, because we all know the women can't keep their mouths shut. Hey, yeah, hey. 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 That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> I just want to clear that up. It really sucks quick. that we had to keep... I just want to clear that yeah, up real yeah. quickly. Get a fucking a, yeah. an iTunes review, That's, whatever. We need a, we're going to get a sternly worded bad review. On Yelp. These guys are misogynists. They don't like women. <laughs> and I cannot listen anymore. And eh, whatever. Just fucking go away. Right. With this scandalous knowledge, uh, they were quickly and quietly disposed of. In a oh. series of killings so grisly and high profile that we're still talking about them to this day. Yeah. Okay. There, there's also talk of him contracting syphilis from his many days of frolicking in East End <laughs> brothels. I mean, that's just a given at yep. that point. Causing him to become insane and naturally a serial killer. Well, that's the obvious natural step from catching syphilis. Right. Unfortunately, the story is spoiled by his being out of London during the murders. Oh, oh and, and the total lack of evidence for any of it. But, but. <laughs> the complete lack of but evidence. But wait a minute. But wait a minute. What? What if he hired someone to do it? And he was out of town because that's the perfect. It, well, that's that's what they said in the beginning, that the queen <clears throat> paid people who had their henchmen go out there and kill off the ladies or whatever. Again, I think it's a. It, this it would make for a, my, this has become my new favorite. Yeah, it would. We, it would definitely be a great movie if it hasn't been already. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's cool. Next up on the list, we have uh, one I did not have any idea about, and which is completely insane. And this person who this is guy I know who I think uh-huh. I know who this is. Lewis Carroll. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, Lewis yeah. Carroll. Yep. If you guys don't know who that is, uh, it's the author of Alice in Wonderland. He uh, he did write that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and through the looking glass and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So even though more than 500 people have been accused as ripper suspects, oh, oh yeah, at one time or another, the most outlandish must be Richard Wallace's theory in his in 1986 book, Jack the Ripper, Lighthearted uh, Friend. Dick Wallace. Dick Wallace. Wallace took passages from Carol's children's books and derived garbage anagrams from them, 
changing and leaving out letters as they suited his bizarre purposes. Of course. So, um, uh, side note, uh, watch the documentary uh, Sons of Sam on, on Netflix okay. for more idiocy like this because uh, people always seem to find a way to contort information to fit their agendas. Yeah, well, like, yeah. like the painting chick. Yeah, but I digress anyway. From the uh, nursery, Alice, okay, his, his book that he wrote, or I guess it's a mm-hmm. short, was it a story or whatever? I don't what was fucking that? know. Anyway, he wrote something. He took, and this is what was initially, all right, so she wandered away through the wood carrying the ugly little thing with her, and a great job it was to keep a hold of it. It wriggled about so, but at last she found out that the proper way was to keep tight hold of its left foot and its right ear, okay? I mean, how else would you do it? I mean, she, she's got a rabbit, I would assume, right, at this time, right? Yeah, but that could be the... Uh... Well, this guy thinks. Oh, oh, oh. oh, what has he got? Let's hear it. He decoded it. Oh, decoded. Okay. Yes. And it actually says. Yeah, let's hear it. Quote, she wriggled about so, but at last Dodgson and Bane found a way to keep a hold of the fat little whore. I oh. got a tight hold of her and slit her throat, left ear to right. It was tough, wet, disgusting too. So weary of it, they threw up Jack the Ripper. I can't even with this one, man. Are you so? So, so he found a <laughs> random passage in the book, and and was just like, "Oh, it's got to say this." That if you rearrange every word in that fucking passage, you get this out of it. He took a uh, he went to the internet and took that passage and put it in a uh, a band name creator, and that's what he got. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's the most insane thing I, 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 out of all of them. That one's just anyway. I don't know. <laughs> it hurts my head. I don't understand why. It's so dumb. It hurts. You, how do you even feel? I, I don't know. Again, a stretch. How much time did this guy waste on stuff? Like, uh, a you lot. You have to go through. <laughs> Just go ahead. <laughs> I know it hurts. It even hurts to even think about it. Next one on our list is Dr. Thomas Neil Cream. Yep. Cream, get on top. So this doctor was hanged for an unrelated murder at Newgate Prison. His executioner, James Billingham, swears Cream's last words were, quote, I am Jack the... Ooh. Shut up, really? Yeah. What he says. Which is weird, because the guy's name was Thomas. But anyway, it it was taken by many as a confession to being Jack the Ripper. Of course, <laughs> but it was cut off by his execution, and it, uh, he didn't get to manage to, you know, to squeeze out the last little bit or be questioned about it. Let's say, like, plumber. <laughs> Jack the plumber! <laughs> what if there's some guy, like, wandering around? I am Jack's <laughs> left kidney. <laughs> like, he was in prison at the time like, of the murders, okay? Like, what if What if he had, like, a, like, what if his real name, this cream dude, was, like, what if that was an alias and like there's people looking for this guy named like he was his name was like Jack and he was a runaway. And what if he was about to say, like, my name is Jack the Runner. I'm yeah. Jack the Runaway. Jack the Roofer. Yeah. yeah. Jack the Offer. <laughs> anyway, what's even great about that or even more great about this was <laughs> he was in prison at the time of the murders. And the notion that he was out killing prostitutes while a lookalike served his prison sentence is pretty unlikely. Oh, uh, so uh, I thought I had the H.H. Holmes stuff in there, but I, I, I guess I didn't. The, uh, when they talked about the, uh, the body, the guy taking the fall for him and being hung. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They exhumed, they, they finally exhumed uh, Holmes' body in, out of his grave. And uh, I guess they dug down, they got to a coffin, and it was empty, which is crazy. What? But then they dug lower, and they found a big block of concrete that he was actually, the body was actually encased in because... There were claims that when uh, he died, he wanted. He said he wanted to be, uh, like, basically buried in concrete. I, I don't know if he was afraid of being a zombie. Or Why something. the fuck did he get to decide that? But at any at any rate, they broke open the concrete block and uh, did DNA testing on the body, and, and it was H H Holmes. Okay, so definitively. So, so the body in the grave is H H Holmes okay, because so, it matched DNA with that fucking so have, budget dude that's trying to convince people that he's the Jack the Ripper. So have they tried to take the DNA from... I don't know. That, all, I, don't, that I don't know. Yeah, if they've determined... They said they're working on more DNA testing on the, in that case. We're going to have to look into this and follow it so, up. Yeah. We're going to have to look because I want to see. Well, I don't know if it's in that documentary because I didn't watch the documentary. Yeah, same. Because, you know, whatever. It's piss poor research right there, fella. I Bush. Never, I never claimed it's to Bush do, League. I never claimed to do anything but... <laughs> it's Bush. <laughs> you hear me? You hear me? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's Bush. <laughs> I can't even do it without laughing. Ah, uh, anyway. So next on our list, we actually have our first female. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Equal opportunity. Yeah, you know what I mean? Diversity. I can do anything. That's right. It's not just an old wooden ship. Mary Jill the Reaper Percy is what oh. they called her. So Mary Percy was convicted of murdering her lover's wife and some suspect her of being behind the Whitechapel killings as well. Though the evidence is pretty much non-existent. So like every other person. <laughs> right. Sherlock creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle speculated that oh, a woman, Jesus. he actually said that a woman could have carried around blood-stained clothing without uh, any suspicion. That's true. If yeah. she had pretended to be a midwife. Because back then, oh, you could show you up and have blood all over you. <laughs> Ah, I was just delivering a baby. Yeah. It's cool. DNA results found by an Australian scientist in 2006 suggested the Ripper, quote, may have been a woman, but only because they were inconclusive. <laughs> well, it's inconclusive. It's a guy. So, you know, it's a good chance it could be a woman. Well, I, I got to say something real quick. You guys wanted this episode. Okay. They wanted this. People asked for this. Do you yeah. hear what we're talking about over here? This is fucking poppycock. This is like two hours of just speculation. <laughs> it's all it is. It's one big, one big just plot. It's, it's just, it's, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Next, we have Michael Ostrog. The guy, the guy, the, the conspiracy theory guy, with the, the Prince Albert dude is still like one of the strongest cases. Yeah. Yeah. Truthfully. And it's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it literally has no tangible evidence whatsoever to, well, the oh. earlier ones have all like a bunch of little like. Me. It's all bullshit, it's, though. Yeah, but there's there's always something to... The only one that's got anything is that... Displace Kar it. Klamarnsky guy. Kl Kamansky? Krems Kamansky. Klamark Isn't it the fighter from uh, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out? What? Yeah, the, 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 the Russian guy. Wasn't that his name? Or no. the Polish guy? What the hell is his name? Oh, that's going to drive me nuts. Everyone out there right now is going, Motherfucker, it's this! <laughs> oh... It's not I, I know who you're talking I'm not telling you either. That's the fun part. Was it Popinski? Soda Popinski! Yeah, I got that. <laughs> yeah, you Put down your phones. You don't have to tweet us. Yeah. Chug the soda. Soda Popinski, yeah. Which everyone knew it was a beer. Yeah, of course. So this guy, Michael Ostrog, much of my uh, Michael Ostrog's life is uh, wreathed, wreathed, whatever, in shadow. Clearly, this was a man who liked to keep his secrets close to his chest. He was born in Russia in approximately 1833. However, we know very little of his life until he arrived in the UK in 1863. Okay. Unfortunately, it seems as though Michael Ostrog had already committed to a life of scams, robbery, and petty theft. In 1863, he was arrested and jailed for 10 months for trying to rob the University of Oxford. <laughs> yeah. He was also using the alias of Max Grief, which is amazing. Max Grief. That is amazing, Wow, dude. that's a good name for a serial killer. Oh, my God. Your comic Max book Grief. character, Max Grief. Dude. Like, like his whole family got murdered yeah. and he's out for revenge. Yeah, like the hitman kind of thing. Like, kind of like the Punisher. Like if you if you gave like the Punisher, the Punisher yeah. that name, it still works. Yeah, John Wick should be Max Grief. Yeah, dude. <laughs> a trend that would continue later on in his life. Great name. Michael Ostrog was not considered a Jack the Ripper suspect until his name was mentioned alongside several other notable Ripper suspects in a memorandum in 1894 hmm? by the one and only Melville McNaughton. Ooh. Yay. Ding, 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 ding. He was the assistant commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, and he's this is the third time we've brought him up here. Yeah. In London yeah. between 1903 and 1913. Remember, he came after the murders? Yeah, right he, after. Yeah. He also played a role in the Whitechapel murders case. In this memorandum, he proposed Michael Ostrog as one of the most likely Jack the Ripper suspects alongside Montague John Druitt. Okay. And Aaron Kosminski. Kremsmansky. Kosminski. Po Popinski. From Flansky. <laughs> yes. However, despite McNaughton's belief in his guilt, it was never proven that Michael <laughs> Ostrog committed any murders at uh, all, like whatsoever. None, none ever. Right. Thefts, robbery, scams, and fraud, yes, of course. But murders, negative. And the evidence remains inconclusive. Yes. Of course. Of course it does. All right. So now this one. Francis Tumblety. Another Francis. Francis, yes. Yeah. Francis. <laughs> Sit down, Francis. Born in 1833. What's his, uh, what's his last name? Huh? What's his last name? Tumblety. Sounds like a dandy. <laughs> when it's France, it's tumble to you. I love the tumble. <laughs> I like that dude probably got beat up a lot when he was a kid, huh? Well, which may have actually brought him to where he uh I guess that could work, eh? Yeah. So his uh his humble start in life, it's a mystery. Some sources say that he was born in Ireland, while others suggest he was born in Canada. Re <laughs> regard I know to not that's even close. I know that's so weird. We know that he moved to Rochester, New York with his family within his life's first decade or oh. so. 
Dumblety moved around a lot during the 1850s and 1860s, staying in various places across the U.S. and Canada, but never truly settling or finding a permanent home for himself. Sure. He posed as a doctor on his travels, claiming to have secret knowledge of mystical cures and medicines from India, but likely this was so simply a snake oil salesman. Correct. It was probably just fabricated to drum up more business and interest in his services. Of course it did. That's what yeah. It was. Services. Though. Yeah. He was arrested in Canada twice. <laughs> Once for performing <laughs> illegal abortions. Oh, my God. Keep that in the back of your head. He wasn't even a doctor. Correct. Then again for a patient's sudden suspicious death. Oh, my God. In 1865, Tumble D mo- uh, lived in Missouri under the fake name of Dr. Blackburn. <laughs> what a world when you could just pretend to be a doctor. Yeah. Like, no one checks. You're just like, yeah, I'm a doctor. Oh, cool. Can you do this? Can you fucking cut me open and fix this? And you're like, yeah, Meh. sure. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> like, the last thing the patient hears is, well, let's give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? What? Is this your first time? Mine too. Yeah. However, this backfired, him him using Dr. Blackburn as a uh, pseudonym yeah. here. It backfired spectacularly when he was mistakenly taken for uh, the real Dr. Blackburn. Oh, my God. Who dude. was actually wanted by police in connection with the murder of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> like, you picked the worst name at that no, time. I don't e- I don't even know how to respond to that. Like that's the, how did you not know? You know what I mean? That had I, to have been everywhere. As a result, I, Francis Tumblety was arrested <laughs> once again. A dumbass. God damn it. Yeah. That's like some dude be like, no, I'm a uh, Booth. John John. Yeah. John Booth. Yeah. Ma, ma, uh, Oswald. Lee Lee <laughs> Lee uh, uh, Har- Harvey. Harvey. <laughs> Harvey Oswald. Yeah. Sometime in the intervening years hereafter or in between, Tumblety moved across the pond here, all right? Possibly to escape further arrest and was known to be living in London by the summer of 1888, our oh. infamous summer here. He again posed as a doctor and peddled his fabricated trade to unsuspecting Londoners, okay? Now, the police began to investigate Tumblety in August of that year, possibly because he was a Jack the Ripper suspect and due to the nature of his business. He was a shady character. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, the files and notes from the Victorian investigation have been lost over the years. However, many ripperologists have since weighed in to give their opinions. Okay. Interestingly, at the time, there had been rumors that an American doctor, American doctor, remember he's from Mm -hmm. over here, had approached the London Pathology Museum, reportedly in an attempt to purchase the uteruses of deceased women. Really? Now, could this have been our tumblety guy? Did he just finally say, fuck it, I'll go get my own? Exactly. I mean, because remember, there there were, what, two of them or three of them yeah. had their uteruses yeah. removed? And it's an unusual request, okay, no matter what, but especially I for gonna, this I time. What he's going to do with them? I don't know. Well, if he's a snake Whoa. oil salesman, is it possible that he thought that it had, like, like a cure for, like, impotency? Health or, properties yeah, to it? Yeah. You know what I mean? This is, my, to me, this is my guy. Really? Yeah. This is your guy? It, out of all of them, this is my guy. This is your guy. This is my guy. Tumble T. Tumble T. Tumble T. Yeah. Francis Tumble T. Yeah, and, and think about that, too. Like, normally, like, if there wasn't a a, a a slew of murders going on where women are being disemboweled and their uterus is taken out, this guy's going around asking the, 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 the pathology place if he can get uteruses. Yeah. I mean, ding, 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 ding. That's a freaking huge light bulb, you know? Yeah. So eventually, Tumblety's ruck, ruck, <laughs> his ruck ran out. His <laughs> luck ran out. And on November 7th, 1888, he was arrested in London. Oh. Although the arrest uh, specifics are not known today, we see that he was arrested for, quote, unnatural offenses. Uh-oh. Which could have meant several different things. Banging dead people? This could have also referred to homosexual relations <laughs> or rape. It still blows my mind that you could be arrested for that at some point. I know, it's just ridiculous and there's some places on this earth that oh, you still you're, can you're gay okay yeah come with us you're going to jail yeah, Wait, it's, what it's illegal in in some countries still yeah i know that's just, it's, it's, fucking it's incredible. stupid it's stupid yeah whatever uh of course homosexuality was illegal then yeah, obviously so so they just put unnatural offenses he was released on bail so that could that could also mean rape you said it could mean rape it could mean like he could be having sex with dead bodies he could have animals yeah i mean who knows he could have literally been walking around he with really a bag need, full of uteruses. He really need to clarify. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, we don't know. Yeah. So he was released on bail, which crucially means that he was accessible and potentially able to have committed the horrific murders of Mary Jane Kelly on November 9th. Remember, he got released uh, in, in 1888. The time frame fits, and evidently the police came to this conclusion as well, as Tumblety was subsequently rearrested on November 12th 
and held on suspicion of murdering Mary Jane Kelly. Wow. So he's actually been arrested for suspicion on this. So she was the first one that was like crazy. She's the one, the first one that had, was disemboweled and had her uterus. Right. Into it. And think about it. He's probably pissed off. Oh, he's yeah. already got these whatever things is they going on with took, him. They took my uteruses. Now I got to go get right. more. Released on bail once again on November 16th, Francis Tumblety took the opportunity to flee London. Please. Yep. He headed to France before returning to the U.S. I would love to look. I might look that up and see if there were any kind similar to that in France at that time. Yeah. I'm going to look that up. And it makes sense too cuz like if if you think about it, like the uh the unnatural whatever is right? If it was like rape or something like that and a woman like turned him in or he got busted because of like raping somebody? Yeah. There's your hatred towards women. Maybe it was Mary Jane Kelly. Maybe she turned him in. Her chaps. Maybe maybe he beat her up or raped her or whatever it is and she uh, got him arrested. And he got in trouble for and that. And then he got out, you know what I mean? And they don't have any of the information. Yeah. All they have are these bits and pieces. Wow. So, of course, he uh, you know went to France, and then he went back to the U.S. And then all of a sudden, he was gone. Poof. Yeah, poof. We need a bigger sound effects board. Yeah. <laughs> the next few years were a yeah, mystery. Like banks of shit over there. Yeah, but it's so hard to go through them all like that. I know. I'm a, yeah. The next few years were a mystery, and Tumblety did not surface again until 1893, five years later. Here's the crazy part. Out of all that, he lived out the remainder of his life in his childhood home in Rochester, New York, where he died in 1903 as a wealthy man. How the fuck did he become wealthy? Oh, I mean, he obviously was a... Hey, what the hell did he do for those five years? Con artist? Nobody knows. I wonder if there's murders that coincide with the five years That's what gone. I'm saying. We've got. I, I want to look more into him. Maybe that'll be like a bonus. What's this guy's name? Francis Francis Tumblety. Tumblety. All right. Tumblety. I tumble for you. I tumble for you. No, sorry. Like religious, whatever. The evidence certainly seems to point towards um, Tumblety's guilt, and wow. indeed, the fact that he was arrested multiple times in How connection is this guy with the murder. Up on the list, yeah, uh, it suggests that he was undoubtedly at least one of police the the police's top Jack the Ripper suspects. He was literally arrested twice for this. And that, this is like one of the guys I never you never hear about. Never, this guy. never hear about it. And well, everything else is. I mean, the the uteruses. Uh, he 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 pretended to be a doctor. I mean, he probably had the garb. He mm -hmm. probably, you know what I mean? He probably knew how to at least use the stuff somewhat because he was freaking doing illegal abortions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this dude, to me, is like, pew, lines right up. Anyway, sorry. So today, many of the details have been lost. The original Scotland Yard files are missing, meaning that we don't know why. Interesting. We, we, they have no idea why he was even charged or what he was charged with in connection to the Whitechapel murders. Oh. However... We can learn from the arrest that the evidence brought against Tumblety could not have been watertight. Otherwise, he would never have been released on bail. Because they let him go on bail. Right. Unless they released him, then got the evidence, and he was gone. Yeah. You know? It seems that there was still an element of doubt in the minds of detectives. But these guys also, they were blaming some dude that committed suicide. You know what I mean? Just because he committed suicide. Yeah, and there were 500 goddamn suspects. Right. Uh, all right, we got a couple more here. We got David Cohen. The theory put together, pinning the chilling Whitechapel murders on one David Cohen, claims that this name was actually the John Doe identity given to him at the time. Oh. He was taken in when found stumbling through the streets of East London in December of 1888, a few short months after the Autumn of Terror. However, it is claimed that Cohen's real name was Nathan Kaminsky. Oh. Not Aaron Kremsminsky. Popinski. Or would it be, yeah. A Polish Jew that matched the description of the wanted man known as Leather Apron who would later form oh. the pseudonym of Jack the Ripper. I didn't know that. Um, so, you know, they call it the Whitechapel Murders. Yeah. Initially, they started calling the killer the Leather Apron. Really? Yeah. I, don't, I didn't know that. I thought mm -hmm. it was kind of cool. Cohen, born in 1865, was not actually named as a potential suspect in the Jack the Ripper ca case into, uh, until Martin Fido's book, The Crimes, Detection, and Death of Jack the Ripper, was published in 1987, almost 100 years later. Mm -hmm. The book detailed Cohen's allergic... Uh, alleged erratic, <laughs> allergic? He was allergic to him. Alleged erratic and violent behavior, making him a good fit for the killer's profile. Okay, so basically anyone that had like a fit of whatever, you were pretty much a suspect at this time. So I'd have been a suspect. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Because I'm mean, an angry human being. Same, same. As per an 1895 article by Sir Robert Anderson, who was the assistant commissioner CID at Scotland Yard at the time of the murders, it becomes apparent that the killer was identified by a witness. The witness, however, refused to come forward in an official capacity, leading Anderson to write, quote, the only person who had ever had a uh, good view of the murder, uh, murderer unhesit uh, unhesitatingly uh, 
identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to give evidence against him. So they had a witness, but they refused to come out. Later, they, they had a witness mm-hmm. and they brought this dude in. Right. And he and was like, is it this guy? And the witness was like, mm, not saying anything. Right. And that actually happens a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. It, it sucks. Later in his 1910 book, The Lighter Side of My Official Life, Anderson published a memoir handwritten by ex-superintendent Donald S. Swanson in which he named Aaron Kosminski as the suspect who matched the description of a Polish Jew. The passage reads, quote, The suspect had at the seaside home where he had been sent by us with difficulty in order to subject him to identification, and he knew he was identified. So they knew he knew that he was a suspect. Okay. But was never arrested. Quote, on suspect's return to his brother's house in Whitechapel, he was watched by the police uh, by day and night. In time, the suspect, with his hands tied behind his back, he was sent to Stephanie Workhouse and then to Colney Hatch and died shortly afterwards. Kosminski was the suspect, DSS. So that's their determination. That's Donald S. Swan. Okay. All right? Yeah, yeah. So there's then there's that guy, which still doesn't seem like a better fit than the one before that. Freaking turntable or whatever his name, name is. Yeah, I think that guy's way better than yeah, Tumble def- Dumbledore, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> All right, I got there's one more here. All right. All right. Lastly, on our list is one I, I honestly did not know anything about as I was going through the research that Moody so eloquently and diligently accrued. I I I appreciate your words. I wouldn't say anything I did was elegant. They all know. Definitely him. not diligent. They all know him full shit. So. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, I, 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 I stumbled upon one more suspect. Okay. All right. I don't know how I missed it, but all right. Yeah, dude, it was deep dive. Deep. Okay. I mean, like dark web shit. All right. Yeah. I, I got to get rid of my computer now. <laughs> yeah. There is little information about the suspect, but apparently he was a traveling charioteer with accessibility to and from the Whitechapel district during the murders. Okay. Unfortunately, his birth date is unknown, making his age impossible to gauge. The only thing Scotland Yard has on file is a single word found near two of the victims and a noise heard by a handful of citizens who were close to the scene of the crimes. That word was handy. And that horrible, unsettling sound was that of a rattling wallet chain. Hello, I'm Jonathan Sayer. And I am Jeff Butchko. Together with my handsome yet musically clueless son, Logan, we host the hilarious yet informative podcast, Icons and Outlaws. Icons and Outlaws. John and I are both huge music fans. And we're seasoned musicians with tours and record deals under our belt. But we're not bragging. Our love for music goes as far back as we can remember. So we thought, let's honor our heroes in the form of an amazing podcast. We're going to dive deep into the life and times of some of the greatest rock, metal, hip-hop, and pop bands of all time. Don't forget the solo artists that rock the world, Jeff. We will be interviewing current and past musicians as well as what we're most excited for. Recording and releasing our own covers of our favorite songs from our favorite legends that we'll play at the end of our episodes and release wherever you listen to music. So subscribe today at our official website, IconsAndOutlaws.com. That's IconsAndOutlaws.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts to get each episode as they are released. Welcome to Icons and Outlaws. And now, boys and girls, it's your favorite part of the show, the movie review. Which top 10 movies will make the cut today? <laughs> you, you, I'm sorry, I couldn't hold it anymore. Oh, all right, so now on to our movies. <laughs> Oh, geez. I can't wait for people to figure that out. <laughs> Didn't take me long. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As soon as, as, soon as you as got to the age, it was unable to be to tell. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, I decided to look up um, the top documentaries on Jack the Ripper. Last week, we did the movies, just yeah. regular film, like feature films. These are documentaries. Television, television series. Yeah. yeah. So these don't look like they're in any particular order. Hard. But um, it, it seems like, uh, I mean, obviously you're going to get most of the information, you know what I mean, from these damn things. Yeah, you are. You are. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Yarp. <laughs> All right. So let's see this first one here. Why did it just do that? Hold on. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, boy. oh, oh I no. Broke, I broke it. Oh, no. Oh, I hate this damn computer. Oh. <laughs> well, the first one is, oh, uh, no. the. it's just called The Victims of Jack the Ripper. I wonder what that's about. I had it pulled up earlier where it actually like went to the damn links for me. 
Oh, hold on, folks. I'm sorry. Pulled out too soon? I pulled out too soon. <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens. I'll just cut this part out. <laughs> So we can say whatever we want. Leave that part up. Yeah, we can we can say whatever we want. Too. Did you just refer to me as White Devil? <laughs> this is how they know you. <laughs> Leave that part up. White Devil, White Devil. <laughs> um, <laughs> hold on. Damn it. Quizuocha. Yes, Quizuocha. Let me guess. <laughs> Remember me? I'm the loogie guy. <laughs> white Devil, White Devil. <laughs> he say, let me guess. A Devil, White Devil. You speak what you choose. <laughs> All right, hold on. All right, here I got it now. I got it now. I, got I it think now. I might like that one better than the first one, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so good. All right. So this one uh, is called Jack the Ripper Ballads, 1888, a oh. scene of the rhyme investigation. This says as the Jack the Ripper murders began to increase in their numbers and ferocity, ballad sellers arrived in the area to hawk their ditties about the crimes. Ditties. So they were they were singers and songwriters that came together. I would. That sounds interesting to me. These ballads weren't in the least bit eloquent, and the resemblances, uh, the resemblance to actual poetry was, to say the least, passing. <laughs> but they were popular, and people s- simply could not get enough of them. In this video, we take a close look at some of those ballads. Oh, man, I wish I could play those on here. I know. We begin with an introduction to the history of street ballads, and get, they go on from there. So that's kind of cool. So make, make sure you guys are uh, checking that, that one out. Show, it? It's called the, ballad of J- the Ballads of Jack the Ripper? Jack the, uh, Jack the Ripper Ballads, Jack eight, the Ripper 1888 ballads. to 1889. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I'm going to have to find that one. Yeah. Oh, oh. Guess what? What? Dr. Francis Tumblety, Jack the Ripper suspect. Nice. There's a whole documentary on him. I'm going to watch that. All right. So this is Dr. Francis Tumblety is one of the few Jack the Ripper suspects who was actually arrested in connection with the Whitechapel murders in autumn of 1888. As we just discussed in this video. We, did. we which talked is, about that. We did. Did we? It did. Did we? <laughs> it did, didn't it? <laughs> which is presented in connection with author and, uh, and Tumblety expert Michael L. Hawley. We trace his life from his birth in Ireland in 1833. Oh, so it is Ireland, yeah. not Canada. Through uh, to his fledgling clear, uh, career as an Indian herb doctor, in which uh, <laughs> pursuit was extremely successful, and as a result became very wealthy and uh, on to England, where throughout the 1870s his name appeared regularly in the newspapers. So there you go. I'm going to have to watch that. That's your boy. Yeah, that's that's my guy. He's my guy. That's the guy. Then, that's the guy. Then there's Sir George Arthur. Dead. Another one who was uh, we didn't talk about him, did we? No, no, we did not. Where did that one not come from? I don't, dude. I told you, there's like 900 people. It was in November of 1888, with the East End of London and uh, on tenterhooks at the prospect that the Whitechapel murderer might strike again at any moment. Groups of wealthy young men began heading to the East End of London to hunt for Jack the Ripper. Oh boy. So they actually had like mobs like going vigilante in. Vigilante yeah. justice. These amateur detectives were just about tolerated uh, by the Metropolitan Police, just as long as they didn't make any nuisance of themselves. It may be said their activities did pose a problem to the official detectives and police uh, constables as it sometimes proved all but impossible to differentiate between these amateur detectives and, and the numerous other ne'er-do-wells who frequented the east end of London by night. One of the young men who headed to Whitechapel in search of the perpetrator of the atrocities was 28-year-old Sir George Arthur. Okay, so he... All right. Oh, unfortunately for him, he dressed in a manner that fit a newspaper description of Jack the Ripper that was then oh, circulating. Oh, no. And it wasn't long before he had uh, attracted the attention of two local police constables. So he went there <laughs> looking for Jack the Ripper. And he was dressed, dressed like <laughs> Jack the Ripper. <laughs> you dingus. What? Christ. So there's that one. Uh, then there's uh, the attack on Annie Farmer. All right. Uh, which obviously I'm pretty sure that one would work right there uh there's another one on here this this all comes from uh jack the ripper 1888 they actually have a youtube called jack the ripper tour this comes from i think like the actual tour place and so yeah, all that's these, a website too, jack the ripper tour like i actually got some good information off of that website yeah that's i'm on their uh their youtube page right oh, now. okay cool so uh, instead of me going through all these damn things which they are cool it's nice to know that i can go back and actually watch some of this there's ones on here about uh what modern detection um methods uh, would have caught jack the ripper um, attack on Ada Wilson, uh, Annie Millwood, the truth about the bloodhounds, and Jack the Ripper. Wait, what is that one about? Hold on. Jesus, dude, we could have literally made this uh, the, these episodes four or five. Ep- it, this could be its own. It probably well, it is its own series in several different podcasts. But God, there are a manner of stories about how Metropolitan Police use bloodhounds in their attempts to capture Jack the Ripper, or at least to capture the unknown miscreant who was carrying out the Whitechapel murders. 
person who is most often in lampoon in accounts of these uh, use of the dogs is Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Charles Warren. We, we talked about him a little bit. Dude. So they had dogs out. Who let the dogs out? Who? <laughs> Can I, Sorry. Can I read this to you real quick? Of course. Was Adolf Hitler Jack the Ripper? Get the fuck out of here. Hitler, what? Hitler wasn't born until 1889, so that seems, well, impossible. <laughs> what if that's <laughs> just what they want you to think? Ah, oh, boy. This theory is perhaps the most convoluted and unlikely ever concocted, encompassing, as it does, several other conspiracy theories Prince Albert Victor, yeah, which we talked about, yeah, that's the one that I like because uh-huh. it's crazy. Uh, is often put forward as a Ripper candidate in his own right. Albert Victor died in 1892 at the age of 28, but of course, this theory says that the death was faked. Oh boy! The prince assumed a new identity, that of a young German boy named Adolf Hitler, who apparently may also have been the illegitimate son of Baron Rothschild. Evi- what? Who wrote this? Evident, quote unquote, evidence for this can be found in that fact that Hitler was once said to have a good understanding of architecture, although apparently he had no schooling in it. Prince Albert Victor, however, had studied architecture. Oh, oh boy! Hold on, where is it? <laughs> also, the fact that Hitler's only sibling was made to change her surname once he rose to power. The dictator claiming to have no sister publicly. Oh. So they're saying that Adolf Hitler was this Prince Albert guy who was in turn Jack the Ripper oh, in this other crazy. <laughs> this is that's it. That's who it was. It was Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Y'all gotta stay I'm off con- them tweeds. I'm convinced, bro. Yep. Oh boy. So listen. I can't believe I didn't find that one earlier. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh boy. So who's your guy on this right now? You know who mine is. Mine's turntable or whatever his name is. I, I mean, just due to the evidence, I think that Kaminsky guy is a, is a, obviously a very plausible suspect. If they've got, if they've tested the DNA three times, and it was on that Catherine Edo shawl. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, that one's that's that's up there too. Gr- granted, like I said, like if he was frequented that area and she was a prostitute, who yeah. knows? Who knows? Yeah. I mean, there. I'm sure there was other DNA on that shawl. Exactly. You know, we don't you know, know what type I mean? of DNA it was. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, dude. That I never heard of that tumble tea guy, but he sounds pretty good. Yeah. yeah, that's who I'm leaning towards. So listen, we want to know what you guys think. I want to know why you think AJ Holmes doesn't exist. That's a, that's its own podcast in itself. That'll be that'll be a uh, that'll be a bonus. All right. I, ha- I have theories, and I, and I'm going to back it up with hard evidence. Hold on, stretched evidence. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure to stop over to our official website, the Midnight Train Podcast.com. At our website, you can buy some super sweet, super sweet merchandise, of course, represent that stuff. Hey, you can get a Duke of Finger Bum shirt over there. We, we were so ahead of the game. It's I know. Funny. We've been talking about this guy. He, did we just. Did we, the Duke of Finger Bum is Jack the Ripper. Yep, that's it. So you guys got to get the shirt now. You have to. You have to make a Duke of Fingerbum Jack the Ripper shirt now. It actually kind of looks like him in the picture, too, on the <laughs> shirt. Too. Yeah. Oh, you got like yeah. a monocle and a big top hat and shit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, also, there's plenty of other shirts and stuff over there. And we're going to have the, uh, the the Life's a Shit sandwich uh, yeah. coming out soon, as soon as I can get to it. Um, yeah. Also, listen, make sure while you're there, go to our sponsors page and, you know, go, go and get some good stuff. Go get some Dr. Yeah. Squatch there's soap. Lots of good stuff there. Their soap is amazing. They're changing the way men approach hygiene by providing all natural, high quality, healthy products. Like, you know, bar soaps and hair care. Dr. Squinch. Yep. It makes you feel like a man and smell like a champion. All soaps and products are Look. made right here in the U.S. using the finest all-natural ingredients. Get over there, click on that sponsors thing, and you and can get 20% them, off. Tell them they should sponsor my beard with yeah. the beard oil. Ooh, yeah, we should do that. Also, Manscaped. Get over to manscaped.com. Fellas. Also, also good stuff. Get yourself one of those sheer things. It's awesome. Plus, they have, like, so many other cool things. Like, they got ball spray. They've dude, got, dude, dude. It's like they have all like day, deodorant. All day, every time you take a piss, you're just like, oh, yeah. And um, every woman fan, out there is like, what fantastic. the fuck? <laughs> so get Don't that. you want your guys' balls to smell good? Yeah, get get some for your man over there. And listen, all you got to do is use code ACCIDENTAL in your checkout at manscaped.com, and you will save 20% off and get free shipping. I did it. Right? I'm just saying that. I did it. You should. And if Moody did it, then you must do it. Yes. Yes. 
I've been handing that uh, that code out to everybody that I talk to. Everyone's like, Manscaped, oh, yeah, I've been dude. thinking about that. I'm like, dude, I can save you 20%. Dude, you know? it's good. Yeah. Uh, you can get their, their one package is normally like $180 or some shit. Yeah. With a, they had a sale going on and the and the code. I got it for under $100. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it got you got the uh, you got the trimmer, and then you get the nose hair trimmer and the ear, like, yeah. the, that thing. You got the... Uh, the spray and the uh, and pair of uh, underwear too, right? Yeah, you get the pair of boxers, you get the the ball spray, and there's like a like a, a lotion too. Yeah, it's awesome. For Seriously. after the shower, it's so good. And listen, if you like what you've heard from us here, and oh, and a handy travel case, and, and the travel, yeah, it's very nice. It's brown and the bag leather. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice. Very nice. Listen, be become a producer of the show. Help us out. Support us. Let's uh, build this thing together. Be a part of something awesome like our wonderful Patreon uh, poopers. Right yeah. now, you know what I mean? Like, they're helping us. So for as little as $5 a month, you can get all kinds of cool stuff. Most importantly are the bonuses. So if you like what you're hearing here, the bonuses are a little more off the cuff, and we can kind of, like, do more fun stuff over there. So Yeah, because know. we know that you guys are the crazy fucks. Yeah. So we can get a little more ridiculous. Yeah, you get down. Yeah. 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 Don't forget to follow us on social media. So Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, wherever you can. Rate us on Spotify, which we've, been, we've actually have uh, quite a few ratings over there. Do we? It's looking pretty nice. I'm going to have to go over and pad the stats. I did not know that uh, we actually had two Spotify channels. What? Yeah. So last week I said something. Uh, I posted something that uh, it wasn't on Spotify. Last week's episode. Didn't yeah, pop yeah, up. yeah, yeah. Well, apparently there were two of them and it didn't know which one to bounce to. And I'm like, they send over one with like a ton of listeners to it. And then they send over another one that has like, like b- barely any. And they're like, which one do you want? <laughs> I'm just like, which one do you fucking think I want? <laughs> Get rid of the one with all the listeners, you jackass. No, it just it was weird. I have no idea how that happened. So it's fixed now. So that is that's that's just the way it Good. is. Good. So listen, we cannot thank you all for all the love and support and for listening to our goofy asses. 151 episodes today. Pretty cool. You passengers keep this train moving. Thank you so much for listening. It really does mean the world to both Moody and myself. It does. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to the people that give us their hard earned money every month to our fearless. Now- do we know that the money is hard earned? I'm going to assume. You got to figure at least one or two of them are just sitting around not doing a whole lot of their jobs. <laughs> Maybe. It's look, possible. Look, I, I don't do much in my job. Yeah, yeah my, true. my money is most definitely not hard earned. Yeah, so whatever. Just thanks for giving us your money. Doesn't matter. That's and probably, That's probably why I don't make a lot of money. And for sending over money for beer. Beer money. Yes, beer Absolutely. money is all awesome. So, Margaret Dempsey, thank you again for that. To our beautiful Patreon poopers. <laughs> To Joseph Aramo, Margaret Dempsey, Kelly Ryan, Corey Krakowski, Nathan Diekman, Hank Sanchez, St- Stacy Laconin. In my head, I'm thinking, you're not going to fuck it up. And I <laughs> fucked it up immediately. Uh, Stacy Laconin, Nicholas Cooper, Caitlin McKinney, Trent Scott, Spencer Dunlap, Jacob Cook, Maggie Brothers, Albert Lopez, Miles Campbell, Brian Gunsman, Margaret Atkins, Colleen Cox, Pumpkin Escobar, Mac Darty, Turner Cox. Uh, Max said over uh, something recently that we got to check out about uh, a movie was made about something like really horrible shit that happened and he wants us to check it out so i'll send that to you yeah yeah, yeah. all right uh to turner cox sydney sayer gina Dude, madison three, we have three cox three no there's two colleen and turner oh i thought there was another one nope then no. you said turner twice mm. oh, okay i'm just saying i like him twice off. as much you fucking threw me off i right? like him twice as now much. i look like the <laughs> asshole and it's your fault <laughs> janet sorrell chad flint chris mcleod justin kowalczyk rob webb over at the fun box podcast yeah. Christina Skelton and, and Jessica Bartolome from the Sister Skelton podcast. What was that? Uh, the Sister Skelton podcast. Not to be confused with of the, course, Sister, the Skeleton, Sister Skeleton, which right. is coming soon in 2024. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good. Maria Gibbs to Chainsaw. What the fuck? <laughs> Jigsaw, Rick Resler, Courtney Bachelor, Katie Brabenek, and of course, Bill Birch. You got to do it. You did uh, it good. Oh, good for you. <laughs> He asked me about that. He's like, dude, what happened to my sound? <laughs> I told you. I don't you. have enough room on my board. You got four banks. I know. It's just so much work. So spread the word. And if you want your name to be mentioned on the show and for us to be forever, ever, forever, forever grateful, become ever, a ever, Patreon ever, ever, ever. pooper. Okay. Listen, two episodes. This is our first back-to-back, like two-part episode, I believe, right? We've yeah, never done a two-parter the before. Two-parter we've done. And boy, is there a lot of shit out there. We could have gone on forever. Yeah, there was there's so many goddamn suspects. Yeah. Like I said before, we just wanted to kind of like we know that all this information is out there. We weren't trying to like reinvent the fucking wheel. We just wanted to talk about it, man. Absolutely. So, listen, you guys stay safe out there. Yeah. Um definitely stay away from uh, anybody that looks like Jack the Ripper. 
Right. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. If anyone's walking around looking like Jack the River right now, there's there's they got a bigger problem. Yep. And as always, choo-choo motherfuckers! I'll go home and get your fucking shine box. <laughs> <laughs>